In 2015 and 2016, the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital in England experienced a shocking surge in infant mortality rates. As authorities worked to uncover the cause of the tragedy, Nurse Lucy Letby came under suspicion. Arrested three times over a period of two years, Letby now stands trial, accused of eight murders and 10 attempted murders of babies under her care. With allegations ranging from injecting air into babies' veins to using insulin to end their lives, the case has captivated the nation and sparked a fierce debate over medical malpractice and the duty of care owed to vulnerable patients. Hear the full story on our new podcast, Nurse of Death, available wherever you get podcasts. Search and press subscribe so you don't miss any of the chilling details in this shocking story. Search Nurse of Death right now and press subscribe where you get podcasts. This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruschi. So, Stephen Smith's body still to be exhumed. Sled already saying, yeah, it was a homicide. And we're going to start treating it as such. I applaud the work of Eric Bland uh, and his firm on this, convincing them finally to take this a little more serious. This is not going to be a conversation about implicating any individual in the murder of Stephen Smith, but more so a conversation about what sort of evidence may be out there, considering this has never been investigated as a homicide until now other than independent speculation this way and that way. Body to be exhumed, so we've talked about that a little bit. We've talked with some forensic experts on that, uh, speaking to the possibility of maybe there being some DNA, maybe under fingernails, things of that nature, with what we typically see with someone putting up a fight and with what we know now about Stephen Smith's death, or at least now that we have confirmed, I think we all knew this to begin with, but that we have confirmed that this was, in fact, a homicide, not a hit and run. If he was attacked, if there was a struggle, there may be some DNA there. Maybe. There's going to be the question of contamination. There's going to be the question of was it all cleaned up in the process of getting his body ready for burial? Beyond that, what other footprints are going to exist eight years after a murder that was never investigated as a murder, meaning there's not going to be all of this police evidence sitting in a locker somewhere that can be reviewed because it didn't happen. So, digital data, 2015. It's like going way back in time, right? We should have like some Western music. In fact, I think we can do that. Let, we good? Okay, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Kids, sit around the campfire. Let me tell you about a time we called 2015. Yes, it was a whole eight years ago, but to you, it was a time of desperation. A time before VR. A time before AI. You see, we... Mainly use Facebook back then, you know, something like that. Anyway, um, what exists? What will still exist? What's going to be in a cloud? Clouds did exist back then. What's going to be on social media? Social media did exist back then. Um, we're talking past the MySpace era. We're talking mainly Facebook, Twitter. Uh, Insta was kind of in its infancy. Um, what is going to be out there? And for that we are going to be talking right now with an expert in the area uh, that can give us some insight as to exactly what's going to be out there. Clark Walton is joining us. He's an expert in uh, forensics and digital forensic. He's the principal with Forensic Cybersecurity Expert Reliance Forensics. Clark, welcome to the Wild West. Uh, but I want to go right into that, Clark. Uh, what's... What's going to exist? What possibly could be out there all these years later? Yeah, so so sort of out of hand, one thing you're you're probably not going to be able to to look at or deal with is um, what you are seeing in some of the other cases that are publicly out there right now, which is the cell site or cell tower analysis data. 
uh, from the provider side, uh, you know, saying that somebody was in a certain area at a certain time and pinged off a certain cell tower, um, that data from the major providers is, is generally not going to be available, you know, certainly not eight years out um, and, and much, much you know, less amount of time, depending on which provider you're dealing with. Um, the data that could be there. Uh, is, you know, any phones um, uh, that would have been in the possession of uh, either the decedent or somebody that may have been involved allegedly in in the the death of decedent um, that could still be out there. And so that could include, you know, if if the decedent's uh, family still has that phone from that point in time, that could be something that law enforcement could take a look at and potentially find, you know, um, media location data, uh, you know, maybe giving bearing on other um, GPS or cell tower data that can be recovered from the phone Mm -hmm. uh, that may give information about what, you know, where that individual was, what they were up to uh, in the moments leading to their death. Um, And certainly if there are any targets of that investigation, if there are um, older phones out there uh, that could be analyzed for basically the same types of information, you know, location data, um, which would be GPS, which can be very specific up to a couple hundred feet uh, or, or accurate to a couple hundred feet rather, or uh, cell tower analysis data, which isn't good for, you know, it's not good to put me at a certain pinpoint spot at a point in time, um, but it's good to put me in a general area at a certain point in time. Um, another interesting thing that that may be out there, uh, if there is a, a, a target or targets in mind uh, are, uh, you know, with with many types of like Apple phones now, for instance, you yeah. know, you you buy a new phone, you get it out of the box, you transfer the data from your old phone to your new phone. Um, and many times uh, certain types of data um, is preserved on the on the old phone to the new phone because it, it's transferring that data at sort of a whole database level. So all the you know, your text messages, your contacts, you um, Certain other types of, again, maybe media and location information is being moved over wholesale. And so, you know, we're seeing now we're analyzing new phones that may have data from, you know, seven, eight years ago on them. Because as people get new phones, they transfer the data one to the next and that data has survived from from many years ago. So that's something that that law enforcement may take a look at as well. Well, the issue with that is Stephen, I'm sure, hasn't gotten upgrades on his phone in eight years. So <laughs> yeah, the decedent, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking more in terms of if there are, you know, suspects, targets in mind. Oh, I hear what you're saying. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, yeah, it, yeah, it, it's yeah. essentially, um, <laughs> we'll just say, cause everybody's thinking it, uh, if there is someone who is involved in this case, they may want to get rid of their phone around this point in time or destroy it. Uh, although that data is probably on the cloud though. Correct. Um, it depends, you know, iCloud came about, I don't have the exact date, but it's been Mm -hmm. over 10 years ago now. So if people are using iPhones, then absolutely that, that could be out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you set your, your phone to do that, it's a much more common thing now this minute than maybe it was eight years ago. Sure. Um, and then if somebody used an Android phone, I mean, that, that has evolved over time too. Uh, but eight years ago in my personal experience, I mean, we run a lot of phones through our lab. Uh, there wasn't much as much going on with the Android cloud-based data as maybe there is now. With something uh, of this nature and it being that many years ago, uh, I know sometimes people do keep their devices. Sometimes they are just thrown away. Uh, would, would the biggest treasure trove for the Stephen Smith family be to actually still have his device in hand? Um. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, depending on the type of device, you know, it's kind of um, it, it's this cat and mouse game with with people like me who do analysis of these devices and then the providers, you know, Apple, Samsung and so Android who make these these devices and operating systems. So a phone from eight years ago, uh, you know, it's very make and model and, and operating system dependent. But a phone from eight years ago, we're going to have a much better run at in terms of all the data that we can possibly get off of it than, than maybe an iCloud backup or an iTunes backup or even a newer iPhone that, that, you know, just came off the shelf yesterday because the community that I work in has had time to really pick that data apart Mm -hmm. and and figure out how to get the most out of it. So yes, uh, 
a phone from eight years ago would would most likely be the the best treasure trove from from that perspective. When we hear about the cloud, I mean, even you know, eight years ago, the cloud did exist. We was maybe we were relatively new, and we were all kind of maybe understanding it better. Uh, but it was oh, you you store it there; it will be there forever. Uh, is that really accurate uh, in terms of well, we're questioning what could be there or could not be there? But we are talking about more technical data, not just someone's pictures or things of that nature. Is there a, a time window that you see with these companies that store this data, the technical type data that no one's going to be looking back on and reminiscing about uh, years later of just moving it off and getting rid of it because it's not relevant unless it's being subpoenaed at a crime? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I mean, if you're talking about the the cell tower data, um, again, time varies by provider, but certainly not. I mean, eight years past that, that, that data has long since rolled off. I mean, think back to, um, even in 2014, like the, the Edward Snowden, uh, NSA disclosures that, that came out. Um, it was why the government was doing what it was doing, right. In mm -hmm. terms of, of collecting and storing this large amount of what we'll call metadata, you know, data about data. Uh, because the providers just were not storing it, and the government deemed that useful for, um, you know, for various types of, of national security investigations. So, yeah, that's been going on for a long time. And I mean, even with um, Apple's policy with their whole phone backups, for instance, their stated policy is um, Apple whole phone backups uh, will time out after six months. Uh, at least that's that's the the stated policy today. Now, mm -hmm. have I seen? data sitting on the cloud that has been past that six month period, certainly, uh, you know, there are whole phone backups sitting out there. And then there are other types of, of Apple, what I'll call data streams, you know, your messages, your photos, that kind of thing that um, that don't have that expiration period attached to them as well. So it, it, it does depend on the type of data we're talking about. What about social media? Uh, that was something that obviously very, you know, still popular in 2015, maybe talking yep. more heavy on Facebook at that moment in time. Uh, yep. But would I know Facebook at that time uh, started to memorialize uh, people's Facebook pages if they had passed away. I have uh, a friend that uh, passed around that time as well, and his Facebook page is still there as a memorial. People can post and such. I don't know personally what happened with Stephen's uh, social media page, if it turned into that or not. Uh, but would those outlets, not a phone provider, but social media, whether it be Facebook, um, at the time, uh, you know, Twitter, uh, MySpace was gone by then. Uh, anything yeah. like that, uh, would that sort of thing be relevant or would it be something that could be accessed as well through, say, a warrant or something to Facebook? Uh, you know, you can always try. Uh, it, it's it's probably worth doing. And, you know, you, you you may get, if you've got the decedent social media, you know it's sitting out there and, and maybe it is, as you said, a memorial page or some other type of preserve state. I mean, one thing I will say is with certain types of social media, and again, it varies, right? With mm -hmm. you know, Twitter's got a different policy from Facebook, Instagram, and, and others. Um, but, you know, once you truly delete a, an account or a profile, there's typically like a lag period because these providers don't want you to, to completely sort of opt out of their platform, right? They want you to come back. And so yeah. even if you delete a profile, there's a period of time where you've got the option to sort of reconsider and, and come back in and your data is still there. But again, that eight years, probably not. Uh, yeah, it's probably long past. But um, to your point, uh, you know, it's, if you know that data is out there, I mean, it's probably worth getting a, a warrant and investigating that and seeing where that that leads you. I personally have not looked at a um, you know, sort of memorial Facebook page. So I know, you know, when you upload data to uh, to those providers, on the public side, you know, that data has been scrubbed. So like a picture, what I mean by that is a picture that I would upload to Facebook isn't necessarily going to have my camera type and my GPS data and all that kind of stuff that would be in the, the version of the picture on my phone if, if I'm just, you know, the general public looking at that. Um, but it would be interesting. And if I'm law enforcement, I'm, I may be interested in, in finding out uh, what types of data those providers may still retain. And the answer may be that there's nothing there, but but there's no harm in, in trying to check. There's inevitably, if they're still alive, someone out there uh, that is seeing this news going, oh, crap, uh, and, and wondering what could they be found, uh, whoever that may be. And I'm not insinuating any one person here whatsoever. 
Yeah. But uh, would, uh, at this point, I think the human reaction, if you are that person, would be, oh, my God, I'm going to go through everything I have from that time period that may have information on it and scrub it right now, going and deleting it. Uh, the yeah. way that things work at this point, does that do any bit of good if subpoenas and warrants and all that will be issued in the coming uh, weeks or months to potential suspects if they try to delete things at this point? Uh, it depends on that time period again. You know, if, if, if somebody saw this coming a while back and started deleting those things and it, th this piece was maybe under the radar, that might have, have done some good. Uh, you know, there are uh, mechanisms out there that law enforcement has in terms of working with those social media providers where you can send a notice and you may be familiar with this in other cases, but you can you can send a notice that is something short of, uh, you know, an actual search warrant that, that's basically, hey, preserve everything you got because I'm going to be coming for this data, potentially coming for this data later. Um, uh, under federal law, there is that mechanism to get that that data preserved, but maybe not in the hands of law enforcement yet. So yeah. if I'm law enforcement and I've got, you know, uh, people in, in mind potentially that I'm looking at, um, I'm going to have sent or will soon send that that preservation notice to those providers. So even though I'm not receiving the data yet as the government, I can I can put those providers on notice that, hey, you know, please make sure nothing is deleted because I may be coming for this later. Which would be relevant and would make sense if you're issuing that to a provider. But if the attorney letter goes out to potential suspects, like, uh, we require you to hold all this information. Someone's having a bonfire that night, essentially. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, no, this is, yeah. this would be a, a legal mechanism um, that would be something of, with a bit more legal weight behind it than just a preservation letter from an attorney. You know, sure. on the civil side, if I'm thinking about suing somebody and I, I issue a letter that says, we may sue you soon, preserve everything from this point forward. That's yeah. a little bit different from what I'm talking about. Sure. Of course. Of course. I, I totally understand that. Uh, just a, from your perspective of someone who works in this area, and I know your area is, is digital and things of that nature, but if you're having a conversation with colleagues in law enforcement that are coming to you and they're asking for you to try and dig up this kind of information, just from a personal standpoint, working with other cases in the past, what else, even beyond the scope of what you look into, would you be suggesting law enforcement to look into in a case like this where the body's been gone for eight years uh, and you know there really was no investigation to begin with? What other angles, if any, can you think of for them to be looking into to try and find information about that time with Stephen Smith? Gosh, yeah. I mean, I, I've been trained for so long. I mean, I've been I've been running the company I run right now exclusively for about 10 years. And so I'm always thinking about where are all of the electronics? Um, so, you know, scraping up any any you know, laptops, hard drives, thumb drives. I mean, think about all the stuff you got sitting in boxes at home that, that you've probably forgotten about. Um, those are the kinds of things I'd be thinking there. Um, to your point about the cloud, I mean, people forget, uh, you know, I've got an old email address from, from 20 years ago I hardly use um, that, you know, when you're thinking back that far, I mean, it's like interviewing any when I go to interview custodians in a case, and when I say custodians, I mean like people who hold information or hold data, there's always going to be something else. So you start talking to those people about, you know, what what phones did you have? What email addresses did you have? What, what kind of computers were you using back then? And you get through the first pass and you start looking into that and you say, hey, wait a minute, you know, what is this Yahoo account I keep seeing? Or what is this other thing I keep seeing? And they're like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. Let me go back and, and you know, get you access to that. And so um, that process, the investigative process, you know, whether it's the on the electronic side um, or if I'm, a, you know, an assigned detective on the case, just trying to talk to people and figure out who else knows what, um, going through that multiple stage process is sort of jogging people's memory looking at the evidence you do have uh following up on those additional leads because there's that long ago you know some people are not going to remember things that they were doing that at the time may have not struck them as particularly relevant um but uh you know that that investigative process of just continuing to loop back and and dig for more information is going to be really important and to steven's parents i mean they're, they're only going to know so much because you know a parent only uh, oftentimes knows so much as to what their kids are saying that they're doing Getting in with Stephen's friends and such of the time, I'd assume would be another very powerful way of going 
How were you communicating with him at the time? Not even necessarily about the content in that conversation. Certainly, that would be another conversation to have. But just the logistics of what were you guys using to communicate around that point in time? So maybe they could even look into maybe still active friends accounts and such where maybe those messages were coming and going from because that information could be potentially stored by a third party, maybe not in whole for all of his communications, but certain communications with certain people would or could possibly still exist if those people are still alive. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, And that that's a good point uh, in terms of, let's say his phone is no longer there, but you, you know who his friends were and you go out and start following up with them. Or maybe even you look at that memorial Facebook page and see who uh, they were communicating with around that time. And, and law enforcement starts talking to those people. And one of them says, oh, yeah, I've got my you know, I've still got my phone in a drawer from from 10 years ago. I know or eight years ago. I know it's got communications with him on it. Um, you can sort of reverse engineer uh, to some extent some of those communications that that are maybe on the phone that's gone if if the decedent's phone is actually gone um, and, and piece together through third parties some of the data that you may have otherwise gotten on that device that that's just nowhere else at this point. Interesting way of looking at it to try and, and find that data and in areas that likely have not been looked at because this was never a criminal matter and nothing was ever subpoenaed or uh, or had any sort of warrant for search uh, in it in the past. Right. No, that's right. So there could be a whole trove of stuff just waiting out there as that investigation uh, finally gets underway. Yep. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. Clark, thank you so much for your insight uh, into this. Uh, I want to uh, continue our conversation as well. I want to talk about Brian Koberger a little bit. That'll be coming up on the feed and about some of those digital forensics that uh, we know about and maybe some things we're not even thinking about. We'll get it from uh, Clark's perspective in just a few moments. Press subscribe, like I said, wherever you download podcasts, you don't miss this. You can get a commercial-free version of the program by going through Apple Podcasts and signing up there. You can even try it for three days free. We appreciate that support. My name is Tony Bruschi. Stay with us.